Christ. Good evening. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. I know we, we get wore out about toward the middle of the week, but God's still good to us, even if we're a little bit tired. Amen. And uh, I do want to say one thing. Uh, when I got back from Haiti, I, I never gave you any kind of report, but the, the children are well. Uh, God's still taking care of things there for us. Everybody's been safe, and uh, no harm's come to them. And uh, I want to thank you so much for your help that you give us in the ministry. We haven't been making as many trips as we used to, and, and uh, some of it's because of some things slowed me down physically and things, but but we're beginning to make, make more. And uh, I want you to know the, the prayers you give, uh, they do miracles. I see God do things that, that just out of nowhere, it's nobody but God could have done it, and it had to be God's people praying for those things. And the financial support you give, it's still, there's widows there that they've got nowhere to turn. There's there's no family to help them. And, and so you help us to feed widows. We have some feedings, and we, we deliver the food to their homes, and try to look after that and, and feed some other kids and some other people and there's people have to go to the doctors and if you're living in a country where it's turned upside down in a war zone and you don't have any money and it's hard to see a doctor so what what few doctors there are there uh, we make sure they go to them now personally I, I told them pastor I said and I'm not trying to be mean the hospitals there, but I went to one of them one time. I had to take some folks, and I said, if there's any way possible, just hang on to me till I get to the house because there was blood on, you know, hit this and blood on that. And those weren't American-backed hospitals, but they do the best they can with what they got. But I just wanted you to know, you you don't hear a lot about everything that goes on there, but but you're being a blessing to people every every month and every prayer. and. And I just want you to know that we, we appreciate that so much, and, yeah. and I thank you again for it. Now, when Pastor asked me to pray about this, I'd already been working on, a, on another message, but I never got to stay there, Pastor. I, I jumped something else. In, the, in fact, uh, uh, today, while I was studying and, and reading the Word of God, so I want to try to be a help to you. So if you have your Bibles... Please turn with me to James chapter number 4. James chapter number 4. And uh, let's, let's, let's begin at verse number 13, please. And we'll read a couple of verses and pray and ask the Lord to help us. James chapter number 4. And begin at verse number 13. It says, Go, go to now ye that say today... Or tomorrow we'll go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and yet and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. Now, now here's where we're going to try to land for a little while this evening. For what is your life? What is your life? And we'll stop there and pray. Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, thankful for this opportunity to pray we do thank you for uh, the answered prayer for our pastor we we thank you lord for how you move and how you touch people's life how you heal how you encourage how my father you you stand people up my father to have become weak we thank you so much for that we thank you for the way you bless our church and this fellowship and god we want to make sure my father that you know we love you and god we want you to be in the center of everything that's done here we pray tonight for for those that uh, have needs outside the church that we don't know them, but you do. And God, we ask that you move and you help them as only you can do. Tonight, Lord, we ask for a protective hedge about the house of God and the word of God. Lord, I, I don't know what the people need, but you do. And God, unless you come, unless you anoint your word, unless you give it out, my father, they'll, they'll get nothing out of this tonight. I yield to you, Lord. I ask that you clothe me in the calling you gave me a long time ago. And once again, Lord, help us to stand and preach the word of God. 
That's always, Lord, we would see Jesus, your son, lifted high and glorified in all that's said and done here tonight. We ask it in his holy, precious, righteous, sweet name. Amen. You may be seated. In the scripture we just read in James chapter number 4, and in verse number 14, James asked a question. There's been some people saying, well, now I'm going to take off, and I'm going to go down to Chattanooga, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to get gain, and I plan to do this tomorrow, and I'm going to do that tomorrow. Everything's going to come out all right. And James, after he hears all, he asks him a question. He says, he said, what is your life? In other words, he says, you're making a lot of decisions. You're, you're, you're living your life in the way that, that you seem to deem is, is God's will for your life. But he's also asking them a question. He's saying, knowing that your life's just a vapor, that just out of nowhere it appeareth, and the next thing you know, it vanishes away. It's we're here today, we're gone tomorrow. Our lifespan seems like when we're young, it's going to be forever. But any of you that's got a little bit of gray hair on your head knows that in a blink, in just a moment, it seems like it's just run past us and we never really were able to grab a hold of it and comprehend what a blessing that youth was that we had. So you see, he says, don't you realize your life's just a short while here? And he's asking him, he says, knowing, knowing that your life is so short, knowing that you have such a short period of time, knowing that it's going to be here today and you're going to meet me tomorrow, uh, knowing that that's going to vanish quickly, he asked the question, what is your life? In other words, since your life is quickly passing by, what are you deciding is so important in your life to spend that time on? That's a sobering question, Brother Van. I wish I could go back in my youth after Brother James asked me this question through the Lord, brother, and, and, and retrieve some of that strength, retrieve some of that time to retrieve what God gave me the opportunity to do and I wasted. I do. But there's nothing I can do about the past. But I am alive now. I am able to to move, I am able to speak, I am able to tell people about Christ, and so the question to me is, Tom Barry, now that you're 68 years old, going on 69, what's the most important thing in your life, knowing that you may not have a long period of time left to spend your life on that you've got? That's a, that's a sobering question to me. May I say this, it's not important how long you live. Now, a lot of people, they'll, they'll run, they'll jog, and they'll lift weights, and, and I used to do that. I thought, boy, if I can just stay pumped up enough, and if I can just run enough, I'll just be something else. Well, I'm like Paul. I, I've decided now that profit is little. My knees don't run. They don't pedal a bike good. They don't jump a hurdle good. The weight that I lift, I'm glad I can get it up to my waist and, and just be able to get it over to where I can dump it somewhere. Amen. Amen. I mean, that's just the truth. I'm, I'm counting on the rapture instead of some kind of miraculous change in me where I suddenly get strong and young again. Amen. So I'm, I want to be about the things that God has for me. It's not important how long you live. There's people that have lived short periods of time. And God has taken them and used them, and they've done a lifetime worth of work in just a few years. In fact, there was a man named Jesus that did more than anybody could ever do in just a short period of time, amen? And then there's people that's had a long life. They've lived to be 100. But when their life came to an end, you couldn't measure anything that had been done for the glory of God and that life for all appearances seems to be wasted even though it seems like they had an enormous amount of time. It's not important how strong you are. Well, boy, if I just felt better. You ever heard somebody tell you that, Pastor? If I just felt better, I'd do something for God. 
Well, if you just do something for God, you might feel better. Amen. Do, you, do you ever think that? Amen. If you just get up and decide, I know I don't feel good. I, I don't really feel like doing what God wants me to do. But I'm going to do it because he loved me and he gave me time to do it. And at least I'm able to make an attempt to do it. Amen. Amen. It's just Amen. common or say, if you came tonight looking for a real deep message, you're in trouble. I'm just going to give you something basic to chew on like the Lord gave it to me. It's not important how weak you are. Do you know that? The Apostle Paul was a dynamo. He hammered, he hammered, he hammered. But he finally got something that bothered him. Thorn in the flesh, the Bible called it. I don't know what it is. Some say his eyesight, some say this, some say the other. Whatever. It is, it bothered him enough to ask God three times to remove it. Amen. And God listened to him three times. Right. And Brother Barry, he didn't remove it. Right. He said, Paul, let me tell you a little secret to what you're doing here. He said, in your weakness, am I made strong? He says, when you carry this and you're buffeted with this and it bothers you to such a great degree then you lean on me for the power and the strength and the knowledge and the hang on to it to keep doing it. That's where your strength is, Paul. Not in getting rid of the problem, but in turning to me stronger and stronger, more and yeah. more. Amen. And watch me make your weakness a strength. Amen. Well, I found that out with Parkinson's. Everybody says, well, Brother Tom, you don't look like you have Parkinson's lot. Praise God. But I went to a new doctor yesterday, and I like him. My doctor moved on, and I got a new doctor. You ever, you ever see that fiddler on the roof, that, that, that old man? He kind of reminded me of him. He just made me happy the first time I saw him. And he sat down, and he just talked to me. I mean, just, just, I mean I'm not easily one over. Boy, I thought, I'm glad I run into you. But he told me things he was going to do to help me and improve the quality of my life. He explained that to me. And you know what? I feel like I come out of there, brother. Boss and I told my, my wife with a, a hope. And there's something about having hope. There's something about having Knowledge that somebody knows something more than you do and they know it's on the way and they're going to use it if they need to right. Right to help there. you. Amen. And I said, well, I'm not shaking like other people do real bad right now. He said, if I took you off the medicine, you'd shake. He said, you'd rock, you'd rattle, and you'd roll. So I'll just keep taking the medicine and just stay as calm as I possibly can. Amen. But I don't like Parkinson. Nobody likes a disease. Nobody likes it something that hinders them or slows them down from when they were young. Yeah. But God. Oh, yeah. God can take something that's not so good and he sure can love on you in the middle of it and make right. it a lot better. Amen. Amen. It's not important how long you live. It's not important how strong you are. It's not important how weak you are. It's what's in your heart, your Amen. spiritual What's here? It's what drives you down deep in your soul. It's what sustains you and keeps you tenaciously moving forward and living life for all that you can live it but for the glory of God. Right. Now you can live your life and get you a billion, billion dollars. You can't take a dime with it. You can't please God one bit just because you did it. If you've got it, they talk about pulling herself up by their own bootstraps. That ain't so. Even the lost can't make money unless God allows it. It's what drives you deep down in your heart. How much value do you put on the life of the blessed Son of God? How important is He to the very being for what you live for? What do you think of when you get up in the morning? What do you think of while your day's going on? What do you think of when you don't feel like even thinking? I, I 
found out if I think on Jesus, other things ain't so bad. Amen. Amen. When I think on him, it's just like things subside. They said, do you ever not think on him? Sure. Yeah. Devil rides up. I don't know about y'all. He rides up around my shoulder all the time, and sometimes he makes sense. I look at him and I say, you, you know that makes sense. You ever do that, Barry? Man, that makes sense. Then I think, well, wait a minute. Now you're a liar and the father of all lies. What kind of tweaking are you doing to this thing that makes sense? I say, get away from me. You've never told me the truth, really. And God's never told me a lie. So who are you going to choose? Who are you going to choose? How much value do you put on God's son, Jesus Christ? And can I ask you something else? How much have you touched the life of others that God brought into your life? I don't believe for one second, not one second, that somebody comes into our life by accident. I believe God has a divine order and a divine reason Yes. For every same thing that takes place in our life right. and every person that comes into our life, that was the will of God. Well, how did we touch their life? How much did we point them toward Christ? Yes. How much did we show them the love of Christ? Yes. And how much were we willing to listen to the problems that they had? Now, I'll be honest with you, I've listened to some problems, and and I've listened, and I've listened, and I've listened, and sometimes I, I'll just be honest, I, I didn't really wish I had listened to begin with, but it was the will of God. See, some people can't never get past their problems. Well, you can't get past your problems till you see Christ. You, you can't get past your problems until you have the love of Christ in your heart for those that have problems. I found out I don't have to pray for me when I see somebody else that's carrying a burden and I pray for them. Somehow God takes care of that. Amen. Are you rich? No. But look at them. Do I look underfed? Do I look shabbily dressed? Now, I've had this jacket for 10 years. Look what God can do with an old jacket. I've got fat, somehow he stretched it. <laughs> Only God can do that. <laughs> How have you touched the lives of others? That's what we're here about. You see, this life that they live, that do not know Christ, is full of darkness, isn't it? And unless you're just completely lost your good sense, You've had to see a shadow that started coming on this world and just keeps coming and getting thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. And all they're saying is the darkness. You and I see light. We're carrying light with us this evening. But those that don't know Christ, those that don't know nothing but the world and what it's pushing on them, they're just walking around in darkness. Right. You know what God put you and me here for? In the middle of a world at this specific time. I believe during the dispensation of grace, before he brings it to an end, I believe he brought every person in this church and every born again Christian to this time. So that we can punch some holes into the darkness that's come into this world. You say, well, it's awful. Look at what's going on. Men want to be women. Women want to be men. People want to be dogs. Everything wants to turn upside down and backwards. That's very dark, is it not? Have you ever turned a flashlight on in a totally dark room? Just a pen light and see how much it punches a hole in that darkness? Do you ever think this might be an opportunity? Think about it. It's an opportunity to start punching holes in the darkness because unless they see the light, I like that song, I saw the light. 
Yeah. That's all the lie. Amen. Unless they see the light, they'll die in their darkness. And they'll go to hell. True. I've had some people do some bad things to me in my lifetime. Yeah. Some of them family and some of them friends, I thought. I wouldn't want to see the worst person that did the worst thing to me in any point of my life go to hell. No. I'd take no joy in no. it. No. 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 And if you would, you need to get to the altar and do some praying. Yeah. Do you realize that every Christian's life is a canvas? It's a canvas. God takes a blank canvas. You come into this world. Painted it up and he said, Paint. Paint. You say, Well, how do you paint on God's canvas? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Do you realize that every single day of your life, you're forced by living that day to turn and go to that canvas? All the paint's prepared. Everything's set. The, the easel's up. You have to pick up the paint and start painting on that canvas of your life. You ain't got any choice. If you get up, you paint. Yeah. Hey Amen. Now think about this and it'll help you. Every single day, a lost and helpless world that's headed for hell sees you get up say you love Jesus pick up your easel and go paint and they see how your paint progresses how that picture that portrait goes day in and day out over and over do you realize that every word we say to somebody. Every word we speak to them, yes. we pick up our brush and we find it. Not only do they see it, but people around us see it. And so we continue to paint. Every thought, good or bad, that goes through your mind, you're still going to paint on that canvas God gave you. You can't get around it. Every emotion you show, whether it's anger, whether it's love, whether it's excitement, whether it's sadness, is still you getting up and painting on that canvas. Now, I don't know where you're at on your canvas right now. I feel like I'm down here. I'm getting down toward in. I'm running out of, I'm working out of room to paint. You understand? I need to be very careful with the pain I got left. Amen. 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 Everything we say, every emotion we show, every expression. To think about this, this is what shook me when God told me. Every expression on my face, people see. And I pick up my brush. Huh? And so do you, by the way. I'm not the only artist God's got. You pick up your brush. I don't know what that little round thing is. It has a hole in it they hold, but I always thought that's pretty cool, so I'm going to hold it. And you paint a little more yeah. just by the expression on your face. Amen. You know, some of you look like you're paying attention a little bit more. Do you realize that every brush stroke, everything you do, everything you say, every expression you have, every emotion you show forth, your pain, your life. You ever heard a preacher say it? And I've said it. I don't know how many funerals I've preached through the years. I think too many. I'll be glad when they're over. Won't you, Pastor? But I've explained to them, I say, I can't preach your loved one's funeral. You know why? Because during their whole life, 
with that canvas God gave them, they picked up their paint with every emotion, every thought, every kindness, every act of unkindness, everything that they should do that they shouldn't do, everything that, that, that brought glory to Christ or didn't, they walked up to the canvas and they painted. Yep. And the picture began to make sense. Amen. It was seeable. So they preached their funeral. All I could do was preach the gospel and words of comfort from the scriptures for the family that was left behind. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that something that shakes you? I quaked. I, quaked. I, 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 I couldn't get out of the room. It's, when I thought about it, I thought, oh, gosh, Lord, what a painting I must have. What a painting. We can't preach your funeral. You preached it. We can't tell people what you think about Christ. You painted the picture. Right. They see your picture. Yeah. The only one I can try to explain is my picture. You understand where I'm getting this? It's simple. Yeah. You're an artist. Yeah. You're painting a picture. The expression on your face, you're painting a picture to me tonight. You do that to a preacher, you realize that? We see it when you go. Or when you go. <laughs> we see it when the Holy Spirit's starting to touch your heart. We see it when you shug him off. And that becomes part of the picture that you paint to a preacher, just so you know. Folks, this world's in darkness, isn't it? I've never seen a time like you. My goodness, I grew up in a, in a blessed time. Kids didn't have to worry about somebody bothering them. The, the, the neighbors made sure that didn't happen. When they turned on the street lights, if you lived in town, you knew it's time to head to the house. You knew mama had supper at 6 o'clock and you better get there. Amen. It was a different world. But this world is darkness darkness and you know what the problem is sometimes we as Christians brother Caleb as Christians yeah. brother sometimes we get this foolish thought that we've reached and arrived to the position that we're just above any sin and all sin God help. Lord help. I, I would think that's a black paint that goes on when you get to that point I believe it's easily found on your portrait, right? You know what happens after we become that way? We start to look at other people yeah. and we start to find out what's wrong with them. Now, I don't like sin, but I still love sinners. Amen? I'll pray for them. You want them in the church? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm pretty sure Pastor Lawson tell you, but if he could fill this church up where the rest of us had to go outside and listen through the windows with a bunch of lost sinners in need of the grace of God, that would tickle him to death. Amen. Amen. I ain't going to give the name. I passed the church one time and said, well, we don't have a lot of people here right now, but we, we, want, we want the right people. I thought, boy, I'm in trouble. I was a young pastor. I thought, I'm in trouble. I lit in on that one. That, that, that sermon I was going to preach, it's gone. We hit in on something else and dug for a while there. And I'm not saying God did this, but all the people that felt that way, they, they kind of died off one at a time. Just me and the rest of them old sinners in the house of God. I'm not saying that's not just a coincidence, but that, that's pretty much the way it went. Folks, you know what happens after we decide that we can decide who's a sinner and judge and tell them how oh, you're awful and everything? We become the bounty hunter. Because they go on a run. You ever notice when you lead it light into people like that and they don't know nothing about the word of God and they don't know nothing about the grace of God and they don't know about the love of God and they don't know nothing about the people of God and all of a sudden they've got this person just hammering them? Well, they go on the run. And so... As bounty hunters, we go find it, right? 
We become not only the bounty hunter, but we become the judge. Then we become the jury. And then we become the jailer. And then we wonder why people don't want to hear about Christ. It's awful quiet in here. Why ain't y'all shouting? I don't know whether it's bro Brother Blue or whatever. One of them used to say, get your head up. I'll tell you when it's time to pray. I mean, I, I remember that clearly because my head was down. Yeah. It struck me and I remembered it. So that's what they think salvation is. What is salvation? That's a good question if you're going to reach the lost, right? What is salvation? Well, it isn't in a bunch of rules that you follow. You can follow all the rules you think is right and still bust hell wide open. It isn't in good works. You think you can work enough doing good works to remove the heavy burden of your sin that was placed upon the back of Jesus Christ? No. no never. It's not in your righteousness. No. <laughs> you know why? Because you ain't got any outside of Christ. Amen. And by the way, neither do I. So it's not in your righteousness. You know what salvation is? It's in the finished work of a holy, righteous, perfect, gracious, loving Son of God. By the way, that He Himself, Jesus, and nobody else, completed on the cross of Calvary and said, it is finished. I don't need you to add nothing else to it. Either give me an amen or owe me. Or stick your tongue out at me. Do something. You know what salvation's in? That precious shed blood of Christ. Plus, minus, absolutely nothing. Boy, that took a lot of load off my shoulders. I'm glad I didn't have to have a part with their salvation. All I have to do is tell them about the love of Christ. Yeah. I don't have to clean them up, dress them up, point them up, set them up, nail them to the wall. All I got to do is tell them about the love of Christ. And the Holy Spirit will work on them, and he'll do all that work that I don't have to do, and I'm glad as a preacher. Right. Salvation isn't in any of that stuff. It's in a name. And that name is Jesus Christ. It's not in an organization. It's not in a plan of mankind or some church. It's in the person and only the person of the blessed Lamb of God who only was the one that was able to live without sin and redeem us from the sin that we had. I don't know, I'm, I'm beginning to feel like preaching. I ain't, I ain't hotter than a while. Good. It's all about Jesus Christ. And, and, and can I ask you a question now? Now we all hear this preaching. But I believe people are really starting to take notice of it. Do you realize Jesus is coming soon? Yeah. Amen, brother. Got a date, Brother Tom. I'm not a fool. Uh -huh. But I do have the Holy Spirit living inside me. Yeah. Yeah. And I do have enough sense to read this Bible. Yeah. And I do have eyes to look and ears to listen to what's going on in this world. And it's easy to see that this dispensation of pure grace is quickly yeah. drawing to a close. Do you know what happens when Jesus comes to get us? <laughs> that brush that you and I had painting this portrait on this big canvas God gave us, we'll lay it down. We 
can't pay him no more. Right. God will put a frame around it. And it's finished. Right. Let me ask you a question this evening. What kind of portrait have you been painting on the mural that God gave you the very yeah. second your life began? And knowing that Jesus is coming soon, you're running out of time, you're running out of paint, you're running out of canvas, what are you going to do with the time, the paint, and the canvas that you got left? What is your life? Knowing all these things that we'll meet him one day face to face. What are you going to do with it? Yeah. I don't want to kick the bucket over and just say I'm going to quit right now. No. What little bit of my canvas that's good, I want it. <laughs> section I ever painted since I've been born. And let me ask you something else. When your, pay, when your portrait is done of your life, how much does it resemble the portrait of the master that yeah. gave you the life and the canvas right. Right. and the paint yeah. and the time yeah. to paint a portrait for him for a lost and dying world to see. I want you to bow your heads. I'm going to pray with you, and then pastor's going to come up and, and close the service. But I want you to think about that. That's If that doesn't shake your soul, I don't know what will. It, it shook mine. Father, I thank you, Lord, for giving me an opportunity to preach tonight. I, I thank you for changing the message that I was going to preach. God sober and thought. You gave us a canvas. You gave us paint. You gave us a life. And you allowed us to paint a picture for you so the lost and dying world could see you in our lives. Now, God, help us to take this serious and help us, Lord, to, to use what time and what paint and what canvas we got left to bring glory to your name and to punch some holes in this darkness that's around the world right now. God, will be careful to give you the praise and the glory if we ask it in Jesus' name.